New Horizons, um, I, everyone is so small in the in the video view that it's hard to see if someone raises a hand. So Dave, I'll rely on you to interrupt, but otherwise we can just hold questions to the end. I'm going to give you a pretty good introduction to what the New Horizons mission is about, uh, beginning at the very beginning. Um, and so let's jump right in with that. Let's see if I can. No, that's there. Are you on the second slide? Yeah, yeah, yeah fine. Okay, well, um, most of you will recognize this cartoon as um, a depiction of uh, the middle and outer solar system um, orbiting the sun. You see the sun in the middle, and then those white circles are the orbits of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, respectively. Uh, I can't show on this scale the inner planets. So uh, beyond the orbits of the giant planets, what we now call the middle zone of the solar system is the Kuiper Belt. That's the destination that New Horizons is headed to. Uh, and the red line in this cartoon is, is a depiction of our trajectory, which is uh, aimed to meet Pluto next July, in fact, on Bastille Day uh, next July, at the time that Pluto's orbit is crossing the plane of the solar system, uh, which is the most energetically favorable um, way to reach Pluto from a launch vehicle standpoint. You can see that we launched back in January of 2006. Uh, we flew through the Jupiter system for a gravity assist in 2007, just 13 months later. And for the last seven years, almost seven and a half, we have been flying the spacecraft across the great gulf of, of the giant planet region. We'll be crossing the orbit of Neptune next month. Then a Pluto encounter begins in January. And then after that, hopefully, we will uh, move on and uh, explore objects in the more distant reaches of the Kuiper Belt, which is shown there um, as a haze of particles. Well, that's a, a very simple overview. Uh, the way that we did this, of course, uh, very simply, uh, that is crossing the solar system in record time. In fact, New Horizons was the fastest spacecraft ever launched. Uh, the way that we did this was twofold. One, we built a very small, compact spacecraft. You might call it the tablet of spacecraft. If you compare mainframes to tablets, you think of Voyager as a mainframe and our vehicle as a tablet. It's much smaller, much less expensive, but has a lot more capability than the mainframe. And then I bought the biggest rocket anybody would sell me, the Atlas V in its largest configuration, called the Atlas V 551. Uh, that, that vehicle is about 80 meters tall, almost closer to 70, actually. And you see there in the upper right, the blue arrow pointing at not just the spacecraft, but um, also attached to the bottom of it, the flaring green cone represents an extra stage that had never before been placed on top of an Atlas V to give it even more speed. So in effect, we built such a small spacecraft that we launched this monster rocket essentially empty uh, with really nothing, essentially nothing on it. And so it built a very, very fast speed. In fact, when we left the Earth, we crossed the orbit of the moon in just nine hours. And to put that in perspective, when I was a boy growing up, and Apollo missions were going to the moon, they launched at 25,000 miles an hour, and it took three days to reach the moon. We did it in about 0.3 days. Now, you might ask, you know, this is sort of expensive. Um, how did we get to do this? In fact, uh, some of the core people on my team worked on this uh, for a very long time to get a mission to Pluto in the Kuiper Belt. And we began in 1989. And at the time, as young scientists, we didn't really know how to sell um, a space mission like that, a billion dollar enterprise. We thought we might commercialize it originally. We thought about something like this. But this doesn't really work in uh, space science. It works very well for Virgin Galactic and the suborbital industry. It works great for communication satellites. 
or land remote sensing, but it doesn't work in science very well. What you have to do in the United States in the science enterprise is make the case that your mission has more scientific value than all the others competing for the same dollar so that you can get to the top of the funding pool. And that's what we did. And it took us 14 years to do that. Uh, it was a very long, difficult struggle. In fact, uh, we went through a whole series of different mission studies working with NASA. And oftentimes, we would get canceled, and we'd have to start over from scratch and find another approach. And uh, for the younger people in the audience, uh, I would just say that if you think of going into science, don't forget that there's a big aspect of perseverance involved, particularly in um, expensive big-ticket space science, particle physics, things like that. Now, what actually sold the mission? Uh, part of it was making the case to our National Academy of Sciences just how fascinating the Pluto system is and how much it has to teach us. And I'm going to give you a few examples of that, and then I'm going to tell you what was really uh, made the difference, what put it over the top, what we would call a home run hit in the States. But let me start with this. And it's something that many people don't appreciate, and it was quite surprising when we learned it. And that is that Pluto is not really an icy body. It has ices on its surface, and we see them in the high reflectance, the albedo of the surface. We see them spectroscopically, but the first time that Pluto's density was measured, jaws dropped, because no one thought of the outer solar system as a place where rocky planets should form, and yet we found that Pluto's density is about twice the density of water ice. And when you model that, it means that Pluto is about 70% rock by mass. It is a rocky planet encased in an icy shell, but it is primarily a rocky planet. And that really surprised the planetary science community. In it, in a fundamental way. Then, as we began to develop information about Pluto's surface, and you see on the lower image, on the lower right, the best picture we've ever had made with a Hubble Space Telescope, we began to see surface details, even at low resolution. There you can see at the top what we believe to be a very bright northern polar cap. And as we were able to obtain spectra, we found that the surface is very complex, with multiple uh, volatiles on the surface, ices that are thermally active. They can move around in the same way that water transports from the ocean to snows on the surface uh, through the atmosphere of the Earth. We found that methane, carbon monoxide, and nitrogen all lie on Pluto's surface, and that all of them can act like water ice does on the Earth. This is a very complex system and uh, is no doubt related to why the surface reflectivity is so bright. Uh, but interestingly enough, if you look at that spectrum on the left, you see that little tiny spectral feature due to nitrogen. And it's a very hard to detect feature because nitrogen just doesn't interact well with sunlight for atomic physics reasons. Uh, but that little kink in the spectrum when inverted, tells us that the surface of Pluto and therefore its atmosphere are both primarily nitrogen. In fact, it's estimated that Pluto's surface is about 90% nitrogen. That's the same stuff that you're breathing right now. 77% of the Earth's air is nitrogen. And on, in Pluto's atmosphere, it's about 90% nitrogen with about 10% carbon monoxide and just a trace of methane gas. Pluto's atmosphere itself was discovered in the late 1980s when uh, the Kuiper Airborne Observatory and several ground-based telescopes all simultaneously observed a star disappearing behind Pluto in a predicted event called an occultation. Uh, and by detecting the signature of refraction, which you see in that little blue graph in the bottom center, um, we were able to establish that Pluto has an atmosphere. 
And what you see in that graph is the light level up at the beginning of the graph on the left, upper left, that black trace, of Pluto plus the star. And then the star goes behind Pluto and the light level drops off. But if you look carefully, you'll notice the light level doesn't drop off immediately, like a square wave. It takes several tens of seconds to drop, and that is the signature of the fraction. If there were no atmosphere, the signature, the, the star level would go away, and we would see only Pluto within just a few seconds as the star disappears. That long decline tells us there's an atmosphere there. You can learn other things from this graph. For example, you see the same pattern on the right-hand side where the star is emerging. That tells us the atmosphere is global, not just a spot like a dome over some particular place on Pluto, but that it's a global atmosphere. And in fact, this atmosphere has now been observed on dozens of places on Pluto's surface, so we know it's truly global. Also, if you look even closer at the trace, the black trace in that center bottom, you'll notice that the slope is it's sort of steep at the top, but then about halfway down, it gets even steeper and makes a U-shaped trough at the bottom. That steepening tells us that one of two things is going on in Pluto's atmosphere. Either there are hazes that are extincting the light, removing the light more rapidly, or there's a change in the refractive index of the atmosphere due to thermal structure um, in the bottom half of the atmosphere. And we're still debating that to this day, but uh, the fact that Pluto has an atmosphere, that it's extremely distended, that is that it's, it's much larger than the planet itself, and that models tell us that the atmosphere is escaping hydrodynamically which is a fancy term for saying the way that the Earth's early hydrogen helium atmosphere left is very interesting to planetary scientists because this is the one laboratory that we have in the solar system to study the same escape process, this hydrodynamic escape, that removed the Earth's primordial atmosphere. And so the high density of Pluto the rocky nature of Pluto, the complex surface appearance and composition, uh, the hydrodynamic escape of its atmosphere, acted like ornaments on a Christmas tree to the scientific community to attract a lot of interest. Adding to that, the fact that Pluto has really fascinating satellite system. When we first started trying to sell a Pluto mission, only its large satellite, Sharon, about the size of Texas, that is about 1,200 kilometers across, was known. Uh, but what was known about it, very importantly, is that Sharon seems to have been created in a giant collision between some former planet and Pluto that spalled material off into orbit that coalesced in orbit around Pluto to become Sharon. And that's the same formation mechanism as the formation of our moon which added even more interest to sending a mission to Pluto because by going to Pluto, we could learn not just about the early Earth's atmosphere, but also about the formation of the Earth-Moon system. Since then, of course, we've discovered Pluto has a much more complex system of satellites, a total of uh, five satellites now known, four small ones, uh, and you see their names there, Nix and Hydra, Kerberos and Styx, and then the very large one, Sharon, they're all shown to scale in the upper left. You see their orbits are all in the same plane, uh, and they're all circular. This probably means they were all formed together in that one cataclysmic collision. And again, this adds to our interest in going there because we keep finding in our studies of Pluto more and more interesting things that bring on more aspects of frontline planetary science, from atmospheric to interiors to the surface to the satellite system, all of these contributed to the case to spend the money on this mission and not some other. But this wasn't enough. Let me tell you what really made the difference. It was the discovery of the Kuiper Belt. And on this slide, I'm depicting the solar system 
as we knew it before the early 1990s, what I call the dark ages of planetary solids. When I learned, the first things I learned about our solar system in grade school, well before the 90s, um, I probably learned what you learned, which is the solar system has four inner rocky terrestrial planets, four giant gas giant planets on the outside, and a little misfit called Pluto that nobody understood. And if you look on the upper right in that logarithmic um, graph, the log log chart, you see the, the, the depiction of the solar system where the horizontal axis is distance from the sun in units of the Earth-Sun distance and mass vertically depicted in units of the Earth's mass. So the Earth on this plot lies at the coordinates 1, 1. And you see grouped around it Venus of similar mass but a little closer to the sun, Mercury and Mars somewhat lower mass, one closer to the sun, one farther. But there's a distinct grouping in the terrestrial planets. And then there's a distinct grouping in the giant planets. Uh, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, 10 to 100 times more massive. In fact, Jupiter, 300 times more massive. And then in the blue box, far beyond the giant planets, Pluto, which is much smaller mass and didn't fit either group, didn't fit the pattern, thought to be a misfit. But the discovery of the Kuiper belt changed all that. And what I hope to do here is to show you a graphic, a uh, visualization of the Kuiper belt and the discoveries of objects in it. But it looks like the video won't start. Let me see if I can uh, try it a different way, because I'd like you to see this. So bear with me. And I'll show this video. Let's start it. I hope you can see it. Yeah, I got it. And you should be able to hear it. These are the discoveries of Kuiper Belt objects with time since the 1990s. Huge numbers of Kuiper Belt objects beyond the orbit of Neptune. They are depicted by their relative sizes. The largest one is about as large as Pluto. Now, as you watch, this is going to show you a view from the plane of the solar system. Pluto is the one that looks closest to us. If you can see my cursor, it's on it. You can see that this is a very fat distribution of orbits. It rises far above and travels far below the plane of the closer planets. And I didn't produce this. Alex Parker gets credit for it. And let me now go back to the, uh, the slides. The revolution of the Kuiper Belt is truly fundamental. Um, here's another depiction on the left looking down of known Kuiper Belt objects, shown in red and white depending upon their orbit class. All the blue dots in the middle are, are Jovian Trojan asteroids. They're not part of the Kuiper Belt. When you look at that, um, I know some of you will see some things that will puzzle you. Um, first, you'll notice that there's a gap near the bottom here, near the six o'clock position, where there appear to be no Kuiper Belt objects. That's not so. That's the direction of the galactic center. That's the direction of Sagittarius. And the star fields are so crowded that uh, we don't normally uh, put our, uh, send our telescopes to look there. It's just too hard. So the apparent gap is only an appearance. It's just that no one looks there. You might also notice that the Kuiper Belt objects sometimes appear to be aligned in radial fingers. And that's not a structure in the Kuiper Belt. That's just reflecting uh, the results of individual telescopic observing runs where quite a number of Kuiper Belt objects will be discovered along a single line of sight in a single night or a few nights. What the Kuiper Belt did was revolutionize planetary science for three reasons. First, it showed us we were completely wrong that what we thought was the outer solar system, where the giant planets are, was really the middle solar system. We had it completely wrong. Secondly, we started to discover numerous 
small planets in the Kuiper Belt, objects rivaling and maybe even equaling Pluto's size. We didn't know in planetary science until the late 90s and the early 2000s that the solar system was very, very good at making small planets and that small planets dominate the population of our solar system. We also learned that there's great heterogeneity in that population. The colors shown on the right are real. You see a great variation in colors, probably reflecting a great variation in surface composition or surface evolution. And we learned that Pluto is not a misfit. There may be as many as a thousand dwarf planets in the solar system. In fact, it appears that the terrestrial planets and the giant planets are the misfit, that, that the dwarf planets dominate the population of our solar system. And that is what so revolutionized planetary science that the United States National Academy of Sciences catapulted this mission to the very top of the queue for funding in 2003. So I think I said what's on this chart. And I just want to point out at the same time we were going through this revolution in discovering trans-Neptunian Kuiper belt objects and their discovery rates were rocketing, we were discovering exoplanets in larger and larger numbers around other stars. And I tie those two things together. They're both due to advancing technology in astronomy. In the case of um, uh, the exoplanets through radio velocity and occultation techniques, in the case of trans-Neptunian objects through big telescopes and sensitive CCDs and very heavy computer processing to pull needles out of haystacks. But in both cases, what we learn is that our view of what is and what isn't a planet was very biased by our knowledge up until the 1990s and 2000s. All we knew about were the inner planets of our solar system and the the middle zone of the giant planets. And we didn't know about the hot Jupiters or the balsa wood planets or the, the pulsar planets, and super Earths that were to be discovered, nor did we know about the dwarf planets that certainly orbit other stars and which we've discovered so many of them now in our own solar system. It's, oh goodness. So the PowerPoint just quit. And now it's coming back up. Can you see it? Yes. Let me catch up. Are you looking at a picture of a little girl? Yeah. You are? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Well, shown, you know, this is something I tell my colleagues we've got to get over. We may have learned that planets were small in number and very special because we live on one. But in reality, there are lots of them. And like the stars, we will never remember the names of them all, and we don't need to. Just like mountains in geology, rivers in earth science, stars and galaxies in astronomy, the numbers of planets are now too large uh, to ever memorize. And no one should ever try. The top part of this diagram shows the planets of our solar system, all of them, Beginning in orange is actually the sun, but then Jupiter, that's too big to fit on scale, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, the blue arc, all much larger than the Earth. Then you can see the Earth and Venus, uh, Mars, and so on. This includes the satellite planets, those satellites that are large enough uh, to be considered planets by many planetary scientists. And Pluto is actually, if you can see my cursor, in the middle of that diagram. My cursor is pointed at it. And this is a bit of a Copernican revolution for us, for you, uh, and, and also for the scientific community. We just didn't realize that planets would be so, so prevalent in our solar system, or in fact in others. And it further displaces us, I think, from the center of the universe in that the kind of planet we live on, a terrestrial planet, an Earth mass class object close to its star, turns out to be very rare. Really, you can see in that diagram at the top that most planets are nothing like 
the Earth. The Earth is unusually large and uh, compositionally uh, much denser with an iron core than most of these other objects in our solar system we would call planets. Those things catapulted this mission to the top of the queue, got us our funding. NASA put out a request for proposals listing these objectives for the study of Pluto and then Kuiper Belt objects beyond. And uh, we wrote a proposal to respond to that list to fit within the budget cap that NASA gave and the time limit that NASA gave to get the mission launched. This is the cover of the New Horizons proposal. It's about as thick as an old style phone book from New York City. That proposal ran about 1,500 pages and described how we would build a spacecraft, how it was designed, how we would build the sensors on board, who the team members are, how we would reduce the data, the, the flight operations, the launch vehicle, the nuclear launch approval, and many more things. Big, thick budget sections, management sections, everything. And we competed with other teams that proposed to do the Pluto mission, but my team, New Horizons, won. And we were told that we won on November 29th, 2001, and we built that spacecraft in four years. This is New Horizons, shown four years later in November of 2005, after its construction was complete. This is down at the Cape where we launched it in Florida. I like this picture a lot because you can see people next to it for scale. It's pretty small. Uh, everything we need for the journey, the guidance systems, the scientific sensors, the flight computers, communication system, the power system, everything is in that box or attached to it. Uh, you can see it sitting on a stand. Um, the black hair curler looking affair on the left is a nuclear power generator called an RTG because we're going too far from the sun to power the spacecraft with solar power. You can see the dish antenna on top. Most of the spacecraft doesn't yet have the thermal blankets, the reflective, the gold reflective material on it yet. So you can really see the walls of the spacecraft. And if you can see my cursor, I'm pointing now in the upper right hand corner at a couple of the scientific instruments. All the scientific instruments point out of the spacecraft where they have clear views. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about our scientific payload. We have the most sophisticated payload ever sent on a first reconnaissance mission to any object in the solar system. It's light years ahead of what Voyager had. Of course, our instruments were designed and built with 2000s technology instead of 1970s technology. But we carry a very complete suite of sensors. Um, I'll start at the top and we'll go counterclockwise. Um, I'll start with REX, which is radio science. That experiment, which uses our radio communication system, will probe the temperature and pressure structure and profile in Pluto's atmosphere and measure the pressure at the bottom of the atmosphere. It will also measure Pluto's surface temperature at a variety of places, and the same for the large satellite, Charon. Moving to the left, you see Pepsi, and you see another instrument, SWAP. Um, Pepsi is a mega volt, mega electron volt analyzer. Swap is a kilovolt electron, uh, kilo electron volt analyzer that together let us study material coming off of Pluto's atmosphere so we can sample its composition and the rate at which it's escaping. Then moving around to the bottom position, you see LORI. LORI stands for the Long Range Reconnaissance Imager. It's like a Celestron 8 telescope, but more sophisticated with a, a thousand by thousand CCD in the back. This long focal length camera lets us begin the encounter about 10 weeks before we reach Pluto and beat Hubble resolution for 10 weeks on the way in and 10 weeks on the way out. It also gives us very high resolution imagery of Pluto. I'll show you something about that later. And it lets us study Pluto's far side, which we will not fly by at very close range because Pluto turns very slowly on its axis. Let us get good images of the far side. And the same for the satellites. Then moving around, the next instrument is the student dust counter. And its job is really a crew science instrument. 
It measures the rate of collisions on the spacecraft by fine dust particles and will be particularly important in tracing out the density of matter in the Kuiper belt. And the last two instruments are called RALF and ALICE. RALF is our main imaging system. It has eight CCDs inside that let us do color imaging, optical navigation, and a variety of other kinds of mapping, um, broadband uh, mapping of the Pluto system. It's not as high a resolution as in LORI, but it has this color capability that's very important. It also has embedded in Ralph an infrared mapping spectrometer, which will allow us to obtain a quarter million spectra on Pluto's surface to map every location we see for its composition. So instead of showing you one spectrum of Pluto like I did earlier, we'll be able to know at every place on Pluto what the dominant composition is of different um, places, whether it's ejecta blankets from craters or polar caps or on mountaintops, frostier regions, darker regions, what have you. Ralph is our composition mapping spectrometer in addition to being our main imager. And then ALICE is our ultraviolet mapping spectrometer that will determine the composition of the atmosphere as a function of altitude. This payload is not only more sophisticated in its capability than any ever sent on the first reconnaissance of another planet, it is also very highly miniaturized. The entire payload, seven instruments, has less mass than the camera alone on the Cassini Saturn orbiter and draws less wattage when they're all running at once than one standard US light bulb. In fact, all seven instruments at once, including their flight computers, draw less than 30 watts. So we got this thing built. Uh, the rocket was delivered on time, and we launched it on January 19, 2006, during a very short, critical launch window to allow us to fly to Jupiter for a gravity assist. And I have a launch video, but we're running behind, and the videos aren't working, so I'm skipping that. You've seen rockets launch before. I'll just say that our first stop was at Jupiter. Uh, we made that gravity assist very successfully. Uh, we also conducted over 700 observations from the Jupiter system. And this was a chance for us to test out our instrumentation and a lot of the software that will be used next year for the Pluto flyby. And of course, it speeded up our trajectory and shaved four years off the flight time so that we could cross the solar system um, in only nine and a half years. Uh, by one comparison, Voyager took 13 years to reach, more, a little more than 13 years to reach uh, uh, Pluto's orbit, although Pluto is nowhere nearby. Um, we were doing it in about nine and a half years. And we had a very good success at Jupiter, not just in hitting that aim point, but in testing all that instrumentation and doing good science. The imagery you see here on the cover of Science Magazine from 2007, uh, one of the premier journals like Nature, um, are actual images made by New Horizons, Jupiter and Io. If you look closely at the satellite Io, you'll notice that blue bit at the top. Uh, that's one of several volcanoes that were going off as we flew by Io. Um, this next slide shows other imagery of Io uh, with the same volcano at the North Pole. It's called Tavashtar. The blue is real color. It's not enhanced, and it's not uh, uh, false color. Uh, that's actual emission from gases in, uh, in the plume of the volcano. On the upper left, you can see infrared imagery of the backside, the night side of Io. You can see numerous volcanoes going off. The one that's Saturated at the top is Tavashtar again, the same one that you easily see in the other images. We made many studies of Pluto's atmosphere, excuse me, Jupiter's atmosphere, Jupiter's ring system, um, other satellites, plasma studies in the magnetosphere. We did lots of science at Jupiter. I think the most interesting thing to show you is this movie that we made of Tavashtar erupting. This is the first time lapse that has ever been constructed of a volcano anywhere in the solar system except our Earth. And it's 
It only spans eight minutes of real time. It only has five frames, so I'll show it to you three times. I'll show it now forward, then backward, and then forward yet again. That volcano has a muzzle speed of about a kilometer per second. Io is the size of the Earth's moon. It is 3,500 kilometers in diameter, and that volcano is ejecting material from the inside of Io up more than 100 kilometers, almost 200 kilometers into space. If you look carefully on the limb of Io at the 7 o'clock position and along the Terminator, you can see bright spots that are other plumes, not as large, other volcanoes going off. But the Vashtar really is the mother of them all. So uh, that's a little bit about our Jupiter encounter. This is another nice image from New Horizons as we left the Jupiter system. It's actually a composite of three images of Jupiter below and then two of its large planet-sized satellites, including Io. And we spent the next eight years uh, flying across the, uh, the middle zone of the solar system. We actually fly New Horizons very differently than most space missions. New Horizons hibernates most of each year. And wherever that you see the uh, magenta or purplish color, we're hibernating. And then the other colors um, are wake-ups where we were either doing course corrections, instrument calibrations, or checkouts of the spacecraft. And what this allows us to do to hibernate the spacecraft is twofold, and it's very important. First, uh, you know, we're doing this mission for about 20% uh, of the cost of the Voyager mission. It's really a breakthrough in low-cost outer planet exploration. And one part of the low cost is not having to have a large round-the-clock operations team. When the spacecraft is hibernating, we use the operations team to plan the Pluto encounter. And it took us eight years to plan it because we only have about 25 people on that operations and engineering team. By comparison, Voyager had over 400 people um, on, the, on the team. The other thing that hibernation allows us to do is to let most of the electronics rest for most of the flight. So although New Horizons will be nine and a half years old, nine and a half years from launch to Pluto and so at the time we arrive, most of the electronics will have a very small amount of on time, about three years. So the spacecraft is, from an aging standpoint, much younger than you could otherwise achieve. I like to make the analogy, if you bought a television back in 2006, January, and you wanted to make sure it was operating in the summer of 2015, you could run it all the time or you could leave it off except for occasional periods each year to check it out. And it turns out if you test electronics that way, if you run things all the time versus leave them off most of the time, you find that the latter is a much better strategy for preserving the life of those electronics. So that's what we did. On the right, you can see where we are now. We're about a year from encounter. Uh, in fact, we arrive 54 weeks from now on uh, Tuesday, the 14th of July, Bastille Day next year. Um, but the encounter itself is not just that day or that week. Uh, we specifically designed this spacecraft to be capable of a very long and intensive encounter with the Pluto system which actually begins after our last hibernation period this fall. We wake the spacecraft up in December, prepare it for encounter. The encounter begins in January. It gets very intensive in May and even more so in June. Closest approach comes in July. We continue to study the Pluto system uh, through these departure phases you see below where my cursor is. And then we begin a very long download or downlink of imagery and spectra and other data sets. One of the ways that we designed New Horizons to be inexpensive was by making sure that it was very capable at Pluto of taking as much data as possible. So we designed the sensor suite to be useful even months out. We put very large uh, solid state memories on board the spacecraft. And we have very fast bus speeds on the spacecraft so we can operate multiple instruments at once. Where we saved our money is in telecommunications. And this spacecraft actually communicates with the Earth very slowly 
from Pluto's distance at speeds of one or 2,000 bits per second, which is much slower than you would ever stand for reading email. And for that reason, it takes us the rest of 2015 from July to December and virtually all of 2016 to get all the data to the ground. So from your perspective, this mission will look a lot like an orbit, not a fast flyby. Although we take the data primarily in the first six months of 2015, you'll be seeing new imagery and new results, as will we on the science team, every month, month after month, for the rest of 2015 and all of 2016. Now, of course, we're intelligent about it because we could always have a failure. We're going to send home the most valuable data sets first, but you never know where the discoveries are going to lie. And the last of it doesn't come down until the end of 2016. Um, we do feel now like we're close to arriving, uh, not just because it's next year, but also because we can now resolve Pluto separately from its largest satellite, Charon, in imagery made by New Horizons. These images were made last summer, and in just a few weeks, you'll see more imagery. We're twice as close now, one year out instead of two, and we're going to make a rotation movie of the satellites, not just Sharon, but others orbiting Pluto against the star fields that will allow us to more precisely home in on the Pluto system because we're actually using those data uh, for parallax purposes to measure where Pluto is from close range where we are and uh, to target our arrival by making engine burns to home in based on those data. When we arrive at Pluto, the geometry is something like this. The red line is our trajectory. Uh, we're coming from the direction of the sun, so the trajectory begins in the lower right, follows the red line to the upper left. Pluto, like the planet Uranus, is tipped over on its side. And you can see the satellites are presented to the trajectory almost in a perpendicular fashion, which means when we're closest to Pluto, we're closest to all the satellites on the same day. That's a little bit unfortunate because it complicates the encounter plan. If, if Pluto were upright like the Earth instead of on its side like Uranus, we could encounter each satellite individually, one at a time, on approach. But instead, we have this geometry. This is what the universe gives us. And so uh, we're going to have to divide our attention between Pluto and Charon and Nix and Hydra, Styx and Kerberos, on that closest day, we have all those different objects to study at once. And so a lot of choreography goes into the, uh, uh, the flight planning. Six different objects that we want to study, and we want to search for new moons, search for rings, other dust assemblages that may be there. And we want to target the spacecraft so accurately that we fly through the shadows of Pluto and Charon because we can use the disappearance of the sun through Pluto's atmosphere to study the composition of the atmosphere as a function of altitude and to search for an atmosphere around Charon. We're also targeting the shadows of the Earth so that our radio science experiment can measure that temperature pressure profile. So we have to do a lot of imagery on approach, send the imagery to the ground where our navigation and mission design teams calculate what engine burns we have to make to fly through these very narrow shadows at very high speed to achieve those occultations. It's going to be very exciting on approach. Uh, this is one little snippet of the flight plan. Each one of those colored depictions that looks rather like a battery uh, like a C-cell battery in the States um, for a portable electronic device is a different observation. This is just a few hours on one day. Um, and the different colors represent different instruments. The red is the infrared mapping spectrometer. The blue is the ultraviolet mapping spectrometer. The green is the visible mapping camera. Uh, the orange uh, sort of color is uh, radio science, etc. And what I want you to learn from this is that we're going to be doing many things at once in a very intensive way. Over a thousand scientific observations with this very powerful suite of instruments, looking at different objects 
Pluto, Sharon, uh, Nix, etc. cetera. Um, you can see those, what we call license plates, the names out to the right of each observation, like the top one says P. Lisa Alice 1A. That's a Pluto observation by the Lisa infrared mapping spectrometer with the Alice ultraviolet instrument riding along for free, also observing. And this is the first in a sequence of these, 1A, then below it, 1B, later 2A, 2B, et cetera. I'm not going to go through any more of this, but I want you to get a feeling for how intensive the encounter is. And then I'll just wrap up by saying we don't know what we're going to find. That's the exciting part. This is a completely new kind of planet. And everywhere we've ever sent a reconnaissance mission in the history of planetary exploration, we've really been surprised. You know, in the early days, they didn't expect river valleys on Mars or volcanoes on Venus or for Mercury to be a planet that's virtually all core, for Io to have volcanoes in the outer solar system. I could go on and on like the ocean at Europa. Right on down the list, everywhere we've been, we found these tremendous surprises when we got close and could really see these worlds in detail. Um, this is an image of something else at the same resolution as our current best imagery of Pluto. And I defy anyone to tell very much about this object in space from this image. This is the true object. You can see how primitive our knowledge of Pluto is today. Our imagery of Pluto will be much better than this imager imagery of the Earth that I'm showing here. Let me illustrate it one more time. This is something else at Pluto resolution. And I think my colleagues in the planetary science community could write a bunch of papers about this image because it would be the best we have about this red object imaged at low resolution at a distance that seems to have structure in it, uh, perhaps a southern polar cap, some sort of lighter, bluer structure in the upper left. You could go on and on and analyze this image and you'd be completely wrong. That's Sorry I didn't get the Union Jack in there on the weekend. <laughs> but you, I'm making the point that we really know almost nothing. And that's what's so much fun about New Horizons. It's raw exploration. And I would say hold on to your hats. Let me show you this. Um, in the upper left is an image of Pluto. I'm sorry, an image of Triton, a Pluto-sized planet orbiting Neptune, which Voyager studied in 1989. And on the right, uh, you can see what Triton revealed to Voyager. Just below that fuzzy image of Triton made by the Hubble Space Telescope in the upper left is a fuzzy black and white of Pluto at the same resolution. And you can see when we got the Triton how much more detail um, the imagery allowed us to see the big polar cap, the geysers, the black smudges on the surface, the lack of craters that tell us that Triton is internally active, and many other things. The magenta inset, the blow up, if you will, shows how much better we will do at Pluto than Voyager would have been able to do had it been sent there. We're going to get imagery that's about 10 times higher resolution than anything Voyager did. That means 100 times as many pixels in those images. And we will see much more detail. By the way, the inset isn't really from Triton. It's taken from an image of one of the satellites of Jupiter, but it's just to illustrate. Let me illustrate our higher resolution one more way. Um, taking that picture of the Earth and blowing up New York City, which is shown on the right, to the very best resolution that we will obtain with New Horizons. And I realize some of you may not have been to New York, so you may not appreciate this. If I put London on, it would have worked better. This is Manhattan Island in the middle. The Hudson River along the left side or the west side of Manhattan. The East River running along uh, Manhattan on the other side, Governor's Island. You can see Brooklyn, big parks like Prospect Park, Central Park in New York. Uh, in Manhattan itself, you can count the ponds. In Central Park, you can see some of the broader avenues running down uh, uh, the downtown. 
you can count the wharfs for the big ships on the Hudson. This is the kind of detail at better than 100 meters per pixel that we will have. Of course, I don't expect us to see any cities on Pluto, but it gives you a feeling for just how detailed the imagery will be. And remember, with every image, we get a compositional spectrum. So we're very excited. Then after the Pluto flyby, we hope to have targets to fly further in the Kuiper Belt and observe smaller, primitive Kuiper Belt objects in the years after Pluto flyby. We're looking for those now with the Hubble Space Telescope. And I'm gonna close with this video. And I think this one works. It's just for fun, but enjoy it. I love the credits. Take a look at this. <laughs> okay, and we have the best bumper sticker in the space business for New Horizons. <laughs> I'll close with that and say thank you for inviting me today. And if I can answer a few questions, I sure will. Yes, I can't hear the question, so maybe David or someone can repeat it loudly. Um, Alan, how far after Pluto will uh, New Horizons last? How far will it go usefully? Well, uh, we we think that like a lot of spacecraft, that New Horizons is very healthy. We think that that um, barring mechanical, you know, or electronics failures, uh, that the spacecraft will probably die of power starvation in the late 2030s, about a hundred times as far from the sun as the Earth is, about triple Pluto's distance. Will it still be doing useful science into the 2030s? Repeat, please. Will it still be doing useful science in the 2030s? Well, I hope so. Um, we have the power to, to uh, do a Voyager-like mission to the heliosphere. Our instrumentation, the Pepsi and Swap instruments and the dust counter, are much more powerful than uh, their equivalent instruments. In fact, there's no dust counter on on uh, Voyager, so this will be a first-time investigation. But Swap and Pepsi have much more sensitivity to study the outer heliosphere uh, than Voyager did. So we expect it to be doing good science right to the end. That depends upon funding, of course, but uh, the spacecraft is capable. Hello, Alan. Um, just a question. The electronics you say is more reliable because you're sending it into sleep mode. Um, I would have thought it'd be more reliable if it's kept at a constant temperature by may, uh, being remain, remaining turned on permanently. Um, can you just explain why that is? Well, there's a sweet spot in the middle. If you leave it on all the time, then you risk um, using up the, the design life of the parts, the capacitors and resistors and the chips, et cetera. Um, if you leave it off all the time, you're not using any of that. If you turn it on and off too many times in between, uh, you risk hurting it with the on-off cycles. But we have only cycled New Horizons uh, once or twice per year, all the way out. And I'm not an electrical engineer, I'm a planetary scientist, but uh, the, the spacecraft design team at the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, where New Horizons was built, is uh, 
among the best in the world, possibly the best in the world. And uh, our engineers uh, designed this hibernation strategy to prolong the life and reduce the risk and help us save money as well. And it's been very, very successful. How long will the information take to get back? Uh, each individual bit has to cross the solar system at the speed of light. From Pluto, that's about four and a half hours. Um, and we can downlink about 100 megabits per day. We're going to take close to 100 gigabits. So even with data compression strategies, it takes more than a year to get it all back. But you'll see lots of imagery um, beginning next January. It'll get really interesting around May. And beginning in June, you'll see uh, new things every day. And that will continue for a year and a half. How accurately can you navigate New Horizons? How do you know exactly where it is at any uh, one moment? So, we, so there's two things involved. Uh, navigation is the art of determining where you are or where you are relative to something else like the Earth or Pluto. And then there's guidance, which is targeting to go where you want to go. And we can measure Pluto, uh, excuse me, New Horizons' position uh, to a few hundred meters using modern techniques. We can measure its velocity to millimeters per second. Our principal unknown is where Pluto is. This is true for every first flyby of a new planet. Until you've been there, you don't have an accurate orbit. You have an accurate orbit, but not a sufficiently accurate orbit. The current uncertainty in Pluto's position is about 10,000 kilometers. So as we approach Pluto, we'll make images against the star fields that, that will use Pluto and the positions of its satellites and their sizes to let us refine how far we are from Pluto. And ultimately, we expect to arrive with an error of only about 30 kilometers um, left and right from where we're aiming and only a couple of hundred kilometers along track, which is our, our less sensitive axis for the trajectory. So our arrival time is going to be known to about one minute. <laughs> Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, so could you run the buses? <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's, it's as good as the German trains, for sure. <laughs> I could not hear the lady speaking, so please repeat. She's asking about, um, uh, will it go through the Oort belt as well? But I think that's a little bit too far away. So. You know, like so New Horizons will traverse the Oort cloud a thousand times farther away, but it will be a derelict. It will be a dead spacecraft. The spacecraft is traveling so fast that it has escaped the gravity of the sun already, and it will fly out into the Milky Way galaxy through the Oort cloud on its way. Where, where exactly is it heading in the direction of space, constellation-wise? It's heading behind the direction of Pluto, which turns out to be the constellation Sagittarius, which is one thing that's been bedeviling us in looking for quiver belt targets. Remember that chart I showed that no one looks in that direction? That's where we're headed, and that's where we have to look. That's why it requires the Hubble Space Telescope to do it, because the star fields are so crowded that you need the sharper resolution of Hubble to find these very faint guys behind Pluto. Do you have one, Jane? Yeah. Um, hi, Anne. Um, I was just wondering, you were saying you're a quite talented scientist. Is there one particular question that you'd like answering? Please repeat. Yeah. <clears throat> just louder. If there's one particular question that you really want answered from this mission. That I want answered? Personally, yeah. Yeah. Your personal question that you really want answered. <laughs> Um, I have to say it's top secret. I've been telling audiences that for 15 years. <laughs> okay. Is that everybody, everybody's questions now?
Okay, well, thank you very much, Alan, for a fantastic uh, presentation across the uh, ether. Um, I'd like to have a vote of thanks from everybody here for spending your time with us today. And uh, can everybody give Alan another round of applause? Thank you all again for inviting me. It was a pleasure. And uh, hold on to your hats. It's going to be very, very exciting next year. Well, hopefully. Could you come back and give us another talk and follow up? To, uh... <laughs> I'd love to. Or are you going to be too busy? Just a wee bit busy, but after encounter me. Okay. Thank you very much. Bye-bye now. Right, thank you. Okay, leave you in peace now, Alan. Thank you very much. Bye now.